Maybe it'll fall by the wayside or maybe it'll become a permanent part of what we do. But would you stand for the reading of God's word? Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, Yahweh of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. And your sins atone for. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. You can be seated as we pray. Father, we are thankful that you've spoken. We even hear that theme in Isaiah. When your people know the value of your words, there's blessing. The bread of life we value, we want, we want it to nourish our souls, we want to share with others. So we commit this sermon to you, we together ask that your Holy Spirit would work through it in just the ways we need, and we also commit this time that we'll be hunkering down in the book of Isaiah, that you would use this in our hearts, in our lives, individually and as a church. We need your word, so help us by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. The very first book of the Bible that I tried to read through as a Christian was the book of Isaiah. I was about nine years old, and I was in a church that was encouraging Christians, even young Christians, to be reading their Bibles on their own. So I decided that's something I should do. And I asked my parents for a Bible. I asked for the King James Bible because it had my name in it. (laughs) And I decided to start reading the Bible by letting it fall open to wherever it fell open and happened to fall open to the book of Isaiah. And I still have the Bible in my library where there's little marks where I'd start reading here and I'd put another mark here and another mark here so that I could track along as I was reading through Isaiah. And I remember, I distinctly remember having no idea what it was saying, but thinking, I know it's good for me. (laughs) Turns out I was not in bad company. The great church leader of the fourth century, Augustine, was also encouraged by a friend to read through Isaiah early as he was early in his Christian walk, though he became a Christian as an adult. He writes, Ambrose told me to read the prophet Isaiah. I think because more clearly than others, he foretold the gospel and the calling of the Gentiles. But I did not understand the first passage of the book and thought the whole would be equally obscure. So I set it aside. Isaiah can be a daunting book. The way Isaiah preaches, he's this powerful, powerful preacher, but 
where his one sermon ends and another one begins isn't always clear. And the way he uses evocative imagery and circles back on ideas and thoughts, it, it makes it hard to kind of get your mind around all that's going on in the book. You might be able to look at a few verses and know what he's saying there. But what is this whole book doing? Even what is a whole chapter doing? It can be hard. And I remember even, you know... Uh, in preparation for the series, I'd set aside a few weeks to really study the book of Isaiah and to try and get my mind around it. And I remember it was the, the, the last study week I had. And I was, it was Tuesday, so I was a day into my study, and I still didn't understand the book. And Matt had just started as the associate minister, and I was in his office trying to say, hey, how are you doing? Is everything going well as you settle into the office here? And he asked me how Isaiah was going, and I'm like, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't understand it. But by God's grace, in the days that followed, the book started to become very clear. It was unlocked for me. And I will say, I am so excited that God has the book of Isaiah for our church in this cultural moment that we live in. Because I think there is no better place for us to be camped out. I chose to preach through Isaiah because it was time to be in the Old Testament because we hadn't done a major prophet and I didn't know Isaiah very well and thought this is a good one to camp out in. But I emerged from that last study week thinking this is the very thing our church needs. So my goal in the sermon is to to allow that same excitement to be shared by you by helping you see the things that I see as, as Isaiah becomes clear to us as a church and the truths that carry through the whole prophecy of Isaiah, all 66 chapters, begin to marinate in our minds and in our hearts and in our souls. I feel the best way to help Isaiah become clear for us is to look at three different topics. The first is the situation into which Isaiah preached. The situation into which Isaiah preached. And I'll, I'll have kind of two, two headings under that. Then the message that Isaiah held out in response to that situation. So the situation, the message Isaiah held out in response to that, and there'll be three comments under there. And then the last, the call he gives to his hearers in light of that message. And there'll be three comments under there. So the situation, the two things under that. The message, three headings under that. And the call with three headings under that. That's, that's how we're going to move forward. Isaiah is a big book, so I'm kind of giving you those headings right at the front so that you can kind of have those hangers as we move through the sermon. You'll know where we're at. So let's begin with the situation into which Isaiah preached. Isaiah prophesied for over 40 years. That's how long his prophetic or his pastoral ministry Extended. And they were pivotal years for Israel. As we just read from Isaiah 6, he began his prophetic ministry in the year that King Uzziah died, which we'll see in a moment was a very critical moment for Israel. And he prophesied for, no one's sure exactly, but at least 40 years, maybe 50 years after that. Now, because this was a, an important time in Israel's history, it's, it's hard to kind of distill all of that. It, there's, a, there's a risk of oversimplifying things. But what I want to do is give you kind of two phrases, two phrases that capture this time in which Isaiah was prophesying. And the first is the sins that set in during a time of ease. The sins that set in during a time of ease. Uzziah reigned as the second longest king in all of Israel's history. Over 50 years was his reign. 
the only other king who reigned that long. It was not a, a good time. It was a tumultuous time for Israel's history. So he really had this kind of long, peaceful reign. Uzziah reigned during a time when the Egyptian power to the south was kind of balanced out by this growing Assyrian power to the north. And because these two larger powers kind of loosely kept each other in check, Israel itself, in between, became this important trade route. They were able to extend their borders, and it was a time of great ease and stability politically. I think of uh, somebody who would have been part of Isaiah's original audience as he prophesied. Their, Their whole lifetime, they wouldn't have really known any major wars, any major conflicts. It would have been a time of economic stability. They would have had one king pretty much that entire time. And it would have been feeling, things are pretty good. You can see again how it's an important message for our time. It's not unlike many of the people in this room who have not known significant wars, who have seen a time where our stability hasn't been significantly threatened, where there's been economic stability, political stability in the world, at least in which we live. But there are sins that can set in during such a time, aren't there? One of them, within God's people, is there can be a complacency. A complacency that allows the surrounding pagan culture to start to seep its way into the church, or in those days, into God's people. So look even at chapter 1 of Isaiah, verses 13 to 15. God says right out of the gate to them, bring no more vain offerings, Sin is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations, I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They become a burden to me. I'm weary of hearing them. When you spread out your hands, I'll hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen for your hands are full of blood. So they've been gathering. They've been doing all the things that God's people do. New moon, Sabbath, sacrifices, many, many prayers. It's just religion is normal. Following Yahweh is normal. But there was this complacency that allowed certain sins to stain their hands even as they're going about the motions. Turn to chapter 48. Chapter 48, just the first two verses. The prophet says, Hear this, O house of Jacob, who are called by the name of Israel, who came from the waters of Judah, who swear by the name of Yahweh and confess the God of Israel, but not in truth or right. For they calm themselves after the holy city and stay themselves on the God of Israel. Yahweh of hosts is his name. You see, you see what's going on there? <laughs> we are called by Yahweh's name. That's who we are. We are Jacob. We are Israel. We are Judah. This is who we are. We fear the Holy One. But he says, not in truth, not rightly. He'll pick up on this over and over again, talking about how you actually don't pay attention to what my word says. You don't. You don't really see me for who I am. One other passage that brings us to light, chapter 58, 
verses 2 to 4. Fifty-eight, two to four. God says, yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. As if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Sins that set in during a time of ease. We can think, hey, we're good with God. We're making our sacrifices. We're gathering regularly. We're meeting as a church. We're putting our money in the offering plate. Pray with my kids. Pray before my meals. Read the Bible. But if the values of the world are seeping into our heart, if we start acting like the world, we're not really honoring God. Sins that said in during the time of ease. There's, there's another one. You heard it hinted at there in chapter 58. And that is just how we treat other people particularly those who are on the bottom rungs of society, the poor, the needy. See, when, when there's a time of material prosperity and many people are doing well financially, it can cause people to become unaware of what it's like for those who are going through hard times. We can't empathize or sympathize with, with the plight of the poor. And so without, sometimes without even being aware of it, we're ending up taking advantage of those at the bottom, callous to their needs. This is typical during a time of ease, and it was true in Isaiah's day. Again, I, I'm just going to read a handful of passages that, that give you the sense of what was going on. So I already had read from 58. I'll be coming back there in a moment, but let's start at the beginning again, chapter 3 this time. Chapter 3, I'm going to start at verse 14 and read all the way through to the end of the chapter. Yahweh will enter into judgment with the elders and princes of his people. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The spoil of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people? By grinding the face of the poor, declares the Lord Yahweh of hosts. Yahweh said, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks, glancing wantonly with their eyes, mincing along as they go, tinkling with their feet, therefore the Lord will strike with a scab the heads of the daughters of Zion, and Yahweh will lay bare their secret parts. In that day the Lord will take away the finery of the anklets, the headbands and the crescents, the pendants, the bracelets and the scarves, the headdresses, the armlets, the sashes, the perfume boxes, the amulets, the signet rings, the nose rings, the festal robes, the mantles, the cloaks and the handbags, the mirrors, the linen garments, the turbans and the veils. Apparently Premier Outlets is going out of business. Instead of perfume... There will be rottenness. And instead of a belt, a rope. 
instead of well-set hair, baldness, and instead of a rich robe, a skirt of sackcloth, and branding instead of beauty, your men shall fall by the sword, and your mighty men in battle, and your gates shall lament and mourn, empty she shall sit on the ground. Look at uh, chapter 32. Chapter 32, verses 9 and 10. Thirty-two, nine and ten. Rise up, you women who are at ease. Hear my voice. You complacent daughters, give ear to my speech. In a little more than a year, you will shudder, you complacent women, for the grape harvest fails, and the fruit harvest will not come. And then last, back to chapter 58. So they already read about these fasts that were not pleasing to God, and now God announces in verses 5 to 8 of chapter 58 what it is that he wants. Is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to Yahweh? Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you, and the glory of Yahweh shall be your rear guard. You getting a little bit of a picture of what was going on then? The sins that set in during a time of ease, and how it might be a very apropos message for our day and age. But I said there would be two headings under this first main point of the situation. The first was the sins that set in during a time of ease or times of ease. But the second is the tumult that arises when the political ground shifts. Sins that set in during a time of ease, the tumult that arises when the political ground shifts. Because Isaiah began his ministry when Uzziah died. 52 years of stability, undone. Unsettling on its own. But around this time, the Assyrian Empire to the north had grown larger and stronger and more numerous, and they were bloodthirsty. As we saw last week, Nahum calls them the bloody city. And they know they need to deal with Egypt if they're going to have this huge empire. And so they start conquering their way to Egypt which means if they're going to conquer their way through Egypt, little Israel, with their northern and southern kingdoms, is in the way and must be dealt with. You can read about this in the kind of middle chapters of Second, Second Kings. But what happens is, the northern kingdoms, they start getting, you know, their little cities and outlying cities start getting taken, and they go, we got to do something. So the northern kingdoms find this other nation called Syria. Don't confuse it with Assyria. 
Syria, and they align with Syria and say, we need to fight. But they also think we're not going to be able to win if the southern kingdom isn't with us. So they say, hey, southern kingdom, you need to join us to fight Assyria. But the southern kingdom, rightly, we'll find out as we go through Isaiah, doesn't align with them. And so the northern kingdom of Israel makes war on the southern kingdom. Now the southern kingdom's in a real bad spot. And wrongly, we'll learn, they reach out to Assyria for help. And Assyria comes in, and the northern kingdom and Syria are defeated. But because of that, the southern kingdom becomes more or less a, a vassal to Assyria. They have to take money from, their own, from the temple of God to pay off Assyria to keep them happy so they won't actually conquer them. Like that. 52 years of stability and prosperity. And now it's all undone. Brothers turning against brother in civil strife. The political ground was shifting underneath them, causing them to feel unsteady and insecure. Who are you going to reach out to in those times? Times of tumult. That's a question many of us are having to ask over these last couple of years. COVID, as much as it's been a disease of the lungs, has been a disease of our psyche that's infected everybody. We feel the instability. And so over these last couple of years that movements like Black Lives Matter is Raise a lot, me too, you know, like, what's going on in this world? And then here in Canada, our, our place where we're able to kind of be insulated from some of the harsh politics and division that's out there in other Western countries, we have the Freedom Con Convoy and the National Emergencies Act. And then this superpower of the last century begins flexing its muscles and trying to increase its borders again. The world's put on alert. Forces gather in NATO-aligned countries and people start whispering about World War III. The tumult that arises when the political ground shifts. And so all of us are left asking, what are we going to look to? What are we going to grab onto for stability? Coming off of this time of ease where there's this unhealth that's rooted in God's people because of that complacency, because of that ease, because of that prosperity, and now the political ground is moving. What are we going to hold to? And into that situation steps God's anointed preacher, his inspired by the Holy Spirit preacher, Isaiah. And that is what the book of Isaiah is. It is a sermon into that situation. And so it is a sermon we need to hear today. Heading number one, the situation into which Isaiah preached. Heading number two then is the message Isaiah held out in response. This is 66 chapters, and I'm going to try and summarize it in 10 minutes. I will miss some things, in, like intentionally. You want me to, or we'll be here all day. But don't worry, we have a year, so we'll be getting to it. But the, the crux of what Isaiah says is really one thing, just one thing. It is, behold the Holy One of Israel. It's 
all Isaiah, I'm oversimplifying, but that's, that's all Isaiah wants us to see. In a sense, the vision he had at the start of his ministry, he wants us all to have. There's this phrase that's repeated over and over again in Isaiah. The Holy One of Israel. That phrase only appears 30 times in the entire Bible. 25 of those times are in the book of Isaiah. Incidentally, one of the other five times is in 2 Kings when a prophecy of Isaiah is recorded. So it's not just in his prophetic book, but even in 2 Kings when the Isaiah, Isaiah is preaching, he wants to talk about the Holy One of Israel. You, um, you might liken what Isaiah is doing to uh, compare it to a solar system. Let's say you look at the solar system. Bear with me for a moment here. I'm going to stretch your... <laughs> this isn't going to be right according to astrophysics. Or it sort of will be, but it's imaginary. We're science fiction right now, okay? All the planets are starting to get out of whack. They're not following their steady orbits, their predictable orbits. Things are spinning a little out of control. And the tendency is to say, okay we got to grab Venus and, and get it going the right way. All right, Venus, this is how Venus is supposed to work. You got that, Venus? Oh, Saturn! You got Saturn, let's get that going right. Earth, ooh, that, mmm, we'll try and get that one going right. It's like Isaiah saying, you know, yeah, those things need to get spinning right, but the reason they're spinning out of control is because the sun has shrunk. And until the sun has its proper gravitational pull. All the planets are going to keep spinning out of orbit. And you're giving all your energy out there. Yes, that's important. we got to deal with those issues. But the real solution is to see the Holy One of Israel in all his grandeur. And once his gravity is at the center of our hearts and our lives, once the gravity of who he is dominates the horizon of our lives, all these other things are going to start to sort themselves out. So yes, Isaiah is going to deal with all these different planets. But the heart of what he's saying is, behold, the Holy One of Israel. Now that's his message. I, I said there were three subpoints under this. That's his only message. And the only reason I'm saying three things is because I want to show three ways he shows the greatness of God. And the first is compared to the other nations. The greatness of God compared to the other nations. Now you'd know why Isaiah goes there, right? Because the political tumult. And everything seems so unsteady. And so what are you going to do? You're going to look for political solutions, right? When the ground seems unsteady and the political ground is shifting, we say... My hope then is going to be in this political candidate or this political party or this other nation that might arise and do the right thing and fix what's going on. That's where our hearts go because it's something tangible. We can see. We, we can see the power they have. And so Isaiah spends a lot of time telling them these nations are, are just they're part of what God's doing in this world. The, the, the rise of Assyria and the fall of Assyria, appointed by God. The rise of Babylon, the fall of Babylon, appointed by God. The rise of Persia, the fall of Persia, appointed by God. The ringing of a cell phone, appointed by God. In the middle of a sermon. You're back with me now. From chapters 13... Up through 35, really, 34, really dealing with the nations and saying, look, all these surrounding nations we are tempted to go and lean on for power, they're nothing. And, and specifically, there's a vision that Isaiah has of a coming Davidic king, a warrior who will 
bring all nations into submission to him. So there's the specific time of their age where he talks about, you know, Assyria rising and falling, Babylon rising and falling, Persia rising and falling. But then he takes all of that and he subsumes that into a bigger story of what God's doing in the whole world through a Davidic figure who will come and conquer. Does that make sense? So the minor play-by-play, I say minor, it was huge in their day, but the minor play-by-play, God's sovereign over. But it's actually part of a bigger story, the meta story that God's doing. So I want you to see this. One of them, there's so many famous passages in Isaiah probably the most famous I'm going to read, which is Isaiah 9, maybe second most famous. I don't know. We got a Christmas one and Easter one. This is the Christmas one. Isaiah 9, 2 through 7. Greatness of God compared to the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as the joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, that these, these oppressors of Israel, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken in the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of Yahweh of hosts will do this. I want to look at two more on this theme of of Yahweh's sovereignty compared to the nations. So look at chapter 19. I'm going to read verses 19 to 25. 19, 19 to 25. In that day, there will be an altar to Yahweh in the midst of the land of Egypt. You hear that? In Egypt. And a pillar to Yahweh at its border. There will be a sign and a witness to Yahweh of hosts in the land of Egypt. When they cry to Yahweh because of oppressors, he will send them a savior and defender and deliver them. And Yahweh will make himself known to the Egyptians, and the Egyptians will know Yahweh in that day and worship with sacrifice and offering, and they'll make vows to Yahweh and perform them. And Yahweh will strike Egypt, striking and healing, and they will return to Yahweh. And he will listen to their pleas for mercy and heal them. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. And Assyria will come into Egypt and Egypt into Assyria. And the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. And that day, the earth will be the third Sorry, in that day, Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth whom Yahweh of hosts is blessed, saying, blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and in Israel, my inheritance. Russia, one day there'll be a highway. And we'll be worshiping with him. You see the vision? He's, he's over all these nations. And at the end of, and the end of time, there'll be people from every tongue and tribe and language and people worshiping the Lord. I've got to do one more passage on this one. Chapter 25. Begin in verse 1.
25, verse 1. O Yahweh, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plans formed bold, faithful and sure. For you've made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The foreigner's palace is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a stronghold to the poor, a stronghold to the needy in his distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm against a wall, like heat in a dry place. You subdue the noise of the foreigners as heat by the shade of a cloud. So the song of the ruthless is put down. On this mountain, Yahweh of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord, Yahweh, will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he'll take away from all the earth. For Yahweh has spoken. True on a small scale, he's sovereign over the nations, we see in Isaiah. But he wants them to see there's a bigger plan. Look, you think these nations are strong and mighty. No, behold, the Holy One of Israel compared to the nations. Where else are we going to look besides to the nations? The second category, we're going to look to the gods of this age. In those days, they were idols, physical idols. Today, what are our idols, right? They're things like financial security. Oh, as long as I got my, my 401k, my RA, I'm all right. As long as my house keeps appreciating in value, I'm okay. Or maybe it's pleasure we look to. It's another god of our age, isn't it? As long as I can distract myself from whatever's going on with this thing that's fun for me, a pleasure for me. When we feel the instability and things are coming on board, we want to grasp what everyone else in our world is grasping, what the world is saying. Grasp this, grasp this. That's what we want to do, right? And God lays into the idols, especially in chapters 40 to 48 but throughout the whole book. So just, I'll just read one on this one. Look at chapter 45. Here's, here's, what, here's how Yahweh, here's how Isaiah shows that Yahweh is more powerful than the idols. Yahweh says, I am going to predict the future. Not predict it, foretell it, because I already see it. No idol can do that. I can do that. That shows that I'm powerful. So Isaiah prophesying well before this figure Cyrus would arise in Persia who would overtake the Babylonians, well before he exists, Yahweh says, I'm going to foretell it. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to name his name. So listen in chapter 45. Thus says Yahweh to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of king, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places. Why is he going to do this? That you may know that it is I, Yahweh, the God of Israel, who call you by name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I will call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am Yahweh, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am Yahweh, and there is no other. The 
Behold the Holy One of Israel compared to the nations. Behold the Holy One of Israel compared to the gods of that age. There's a third way Yahweh's greatness is held out. And that's compared to the power of our sin. There's this really big tension. It's one of the hard parts to solve as you read Isaiah. Because over and over again, Isaiah is saying, there's coming a day when I'm going to restore the fortunes of Judah. Good days are coming. The day of the Lord's coming. And sometimes he's talking about these little times in the micro story. Sometimes he's talking about the big time and the meta story. But he keeps talking about this day of restoration. But then he intermixes that all the time saying, and I'm going to judge you because you guys are really sinful. And so there's this tension like, yeah, we're really bad people. All these things he's saying, I see in my own heart what's going on. How can we, who are so cruddy, become this great city that God is going to establish. And you know how the world tends to answer? Like this, this is a real question that we have to wrestle with, right? We live in a cruddy situation. Things are dark. There's a lot to cause us to despair, both in our private lives and in the world. And how are we going to get to this utopia, to this new kingdom it's, the world wants, is asking that question. The world's answer is as the inherent goodness of man arises and we, our brotherhood, we, we link arms together in a communal spirit and draw the best out in one another and cooperate and work together. We're going to be able to achieve this. Trust in our good ri- reason and science and the ability to overcome whatever world's problems there are and That's foolish. Any study of the history of man, we're a mess. And it's naive because you look in your own heart and you're good. Isaiah does not think that's the solution. He doesn't think, well, we have this utopia we're aiming for, and so I'm calling on you guys to just be good enough. Just be more righteous, be a little bit more like Yahweh. Everything's going to be okay. No. There's a figure who has to come and deal with our sin, to make atonement for our sin. The other most famous passage in Isaiah, chapter 53. Most of you are probably familiar with the whole chapter. I'll just read verses 5 and 6. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And you always laid on him the iniquity of us all. Behold the Holy One of Israel, going to come like a Davidic king, and he's going he's to conquer the nations, and he's going to be the one who establishes a kingdom. Behold the Holy One of Israel, who's going to come like a lamb to the slaughter and deal with the sin in our hearts and make us whole. Imagine you're drowning. There's a dense fog in the sea that you're drowning in. You're fighting to try and keep your head above water, and there's these little, like there's like a water bottle there, a little splinter of an oar over here. You're like, oh, I'll grab that. That might help me. That might help me. That I'll hold on to that water, water bottle. I mean, what are you supposed to grab onto? There's nothing, and you're drowning. Little do you know, right behind you is a lifeboat. It's like Isaiah's coming along and saying, you're grabbing that pencil in the water, you're grabbing that water bottle, there is a lifeboat right here. Behold the Holy One of Israel. He's there, you don't have to grasp on all these things. Just grab him. 
He'll deal with your sin. He'll make you holy. And he'll make you find refuge in him. And you'll be safe. He's, he's steering this thing to a good place. And if you're in him, you're all right. The situation, the message, the call to his hearers in light of that message. I'll be briefest here. So what do we do? What, 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 is, what does Isaiah want us to do? How does he want us to live? If we're supposed to be so, but now we behold him. What's the response? And the first response is repentance. To turn from our sins, to not embrace our sin. Right? He says that over and over again. The word repent doesn't repeat, but the call to turn from our sin is over and over again. Because if we want to hold on to our sin, we're not going to be able to get on the lifeboat. It's like we're holding on to this, and you know, we're holding on to the water bottle, and the, you know, the, the pencil, the shard of the oar, we're, even while we drown. No, you've got to let go of that and grab on to the lifeboat. Got to repent. Number one, I said there are three things under this call. First was repent. The second one is to fear not. These next two, I'm just going to race through Isaiah and read a bunch of verses. You can turn with me if you want, if you're fast page turner, or you can hear them either way. Maybe you're just jotting them down in your notes. But listen to the call to fear not, Israel. Starting at chapter 8, verse 12. Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. Then chapter 12, verse 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid for Yahweh. Yahweh is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Chapter 41 and verse 10. Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. We sing that verse often. And then still in chapter 41, verse 13, and the beginning of verse 14. For I, Yahweh your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. Fear not, you worm, Jacob, you men of Israel. And then chapter 43, verse 1. But now, thus says Yahweh, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, your mind. And in the same chapter, verse 5, fear not, for I am with you. Turn to chapter 44, verse 2. Thus says Yahweh who made you, who formed you from the womb and will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. And verses 7 and 8 in the same chapter. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me since I have appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? There is no rock. I know not any. Chapter 51, verse 7. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear not the reproach of man, nor be dismayed by their revilings. And in the same chapter, verse 12, I, I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you're afraid of man who dies, of a son of man who's made like grass? And then in chapter 54, verse 4, Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You will, 
remember no more. And lastly, and still in chapter 54, verse 14. In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear. And from terror, for it shall not come near you. Could Isaiah be more clear in his message? When we behold the Holy One of Israel and we're hiding in him, we have no reason to fear. And the last, repent, fear not, and wait. Wait. I'm going to do the same thing that I just did with fear not. I'm doing that because I want you to see it's not just me kind of cherry picking a verse out of Isaiah, but this is a repeated theme. And I want you to hear God's word calling you in your situation, me in my situation, what the Holy One of Israel is saying. So we'll do this starting in chapter 8. 8, verse 17. I will wait for Yahweh, who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Chapter 25, verse 9. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is Yahweh. We've waited for him. Let's be glad and rejoice in his salvation. 26, verse 8. In the path of your judgments, O Yahweh, we wait for you. Your name and remembrance are the desire of our soul. Chapter 30, verse 18. Therefore, Yahweh waits to be gracious to you. And therefore, he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For Yahweh is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. Chapter 33, verse 2. O Yahweh, be gracious to, uh, gracious to us. We wait for you. Be our arm every morning, our salvation in the time of trouble. Chapter 39, verses 30 and 31. Sorry, that's not, I wrote that down wrong. So we'll just skip that one. <laughs> Chapter 49, verse 23. You know, read the last half of it. Then you will know that I am Yahweh. Those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. Chapter 51, verse 5. My righteousness draws near. My salvation has gone out. And my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me. And for my arm, they wait. And lastly, chapter 64, verse 4. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. So that's the call. Once we, once we see God for who he is, we repent. And then we don't be afraid. And we can wait. And I love how Isaiah prophecies. He's just this brilliant, evocative imagery. He's weaving things together all over the place. He's preaching these punchy sermons over and over, calling on us. But another thing he's doing, he's laying out these clues that ultimately are pointing to the Messiah, Jesus is not just behold the Holy One of Israel. He wants us to see specifically how God, the Holy One of Israel, is going to accomplish the saving plan through this Davidic warrior, through this lamb that would be slain. So it's a Christ-exalting book. I wish, I wish I could say so much more about this book, but I hope you're beginning to grasp what Isaiah is doing and why it's so important for us. In this time that we are living in now, our church and our world needs to behold the Holy One of Israel and see that that is where stability is found. And once we see him, all else is in order. We can climb in a lifeboat and stop drowning. We can fear not. We can wait. May God work in us in that way through this series. Would you pray with me?
God, thank you for planting our church in this book. There can be many things that are hard to understand, but as we journey, may you cause us to see you rightly. Amen.